The lesson isn't always necessarily in the success. The lesson is in the failure. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, whatever you celebrate, just celebrate it because it's that time of the year. It's a time of the year to be happy, to be festive, and it's also the last episode of the Scar Tissue Podcast for the year as well. And what an interesting year it's been. I've been kind of mumbling and fumbling my way through these uh, these interviews, but it's given me a chance to really meet some very interesting people and learn really from the best, uh, from the things they've done well and the things that they've done not so well, but they've learned from them. And that's what the Scar Tissue series is supposed to be all about. Now, this last guest, and I'm, um, I, don't, I don't think I could cap this year off any better with a better guest. He really embodies what the show is supposed to be all about. He's someone who's lived really the first half of his life as a mistake, and, and that's from his words, not mine. He's uh, a former mobster for the New York for a New York crime family called the Gambinos, and he was a very successful mobster working for for John Gotti, netting millions of dollars. So you can imagine he was a fast rising star in that world. He eventually got locked up, and he was facing life in prison, and got sentenced to fifteen years. And within prison, he decided to start a new leaf. He decided to leave the world of the mob behind. And uh, he found a love of reading, and that eventually led led to him wanting to pursue a career as an author. And when he when he got out of prison, that's what he, that's exactly what he did. He, he he left the mob behind, and he became an author and a successful one at that with a best selling book called Mob Rules. And he's got a few other books. I definitely suggest you to check out there. They're some great stuff. And he became a host of a TV series called um, Inside the Gangsters Code on the Discovery Channel. So. What makes him so interesting and so unique is that he's lived these two lives, but in both lives he was successful. Whatever he's put his mind to, he's become successful at, against all odds. Uh, and there's traits within a person like Lou we can learn from. We can, and he's he's very transparent about those flaws, and he shows you them. He bears them uh, without fear, and he does so with honor to show you how to learn from the things he's done wrong and also to learn the things he's done right. And he's so well-read and so articulate. Um, and he's read thousands of books. So, so I think he does such a great job of, of helping us all understand how we can improve ourselves as, um, as business leaders and as people, as people who are always, always challenged by the right and wrong things to do in life, as all humans are, as we are all flawed, uh, how we're always trying to look for that moral North Star. Um, Louis does a great job of helping uh, us show how he's been able to to correct himself along the years. And this is uh, this was supposed to be a two-part interview. Unfortunately, the first part, the audio quality was terrible, so I'm not going to release that. I think we're going to suffer. Uh, you would lose the value in the lessons that, that was garnered in the conversation because of the quality of that audio. So all I've done is I've, I've kind of teased out some of those key lessons, and I've put them up on a blog on my website, www.scartissuepodcast.com. Go there, look up Louis Ferrante, and you'll see some of those key lessons from part one. And part one will really cover how he got into the mob and um, uh, just as he's leaving prison there, and we kind of cut off and we started part two. Part two right now is what you're listening to. We pick that up. So we talk about where, where he is at his life right now um, and what it was like to leave prison. Uh, and, there's, and there's a lot of lessons there that I, I'm not going to do any justice of trying to explain in this introduction. I'd rather you just sit down and enjoy this episode with a man who has a lot to give, who's lived an interesting life, a colorful life, Louis Ferrante. Okay, let's rock and roll. Let's, let's make it happen. Brother. Let's make it happen, baby. It's, uh, okay. it, it is recording, yep. just so you know. Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks, bro. So how you been? Happy Hanukkah. Good, man. Thank you. Good, good. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, I've been, I've been rocking and rolling. I'm trying to, you know, I'm chipping away at my book. And uh, it's, it's a lot of research. I've never written a history before. Oh, you so didn't say you didn't really you're writing a history me. book. Oh, is that what you're doing? I am. Yeah, I am indeed. I'll tell you, it's a crazy story how it came about. I, I, was, in, I was invited to Sicily. The, there was uh, the CEO of a German company read my book, and he invited me to Sicily for his, sort of like an annual retreat for his editors. He controls the biggest media group in Germany and Eastern Europe. And I go there, and I'm sitting next to this older man, 
and we hit it off. And I always like, I always gravitate towards older, I guess, older, older men who have been around experiences, whether it was in my mob life or even today, you know, they've been there and done that seen, you know, it's more wisdom. So we're talking and we're going, we're speaking about history and he's, he's really, really knowledgeable. We were talking about sort of like all 20th century. We we went around the globe and at some point we get to, we get to world war two. And he says, I fled the Wehrmacht. With, with 16 shillings in my pocket when they rolled into Austria. I said, you have to be kidding me. You know, you, 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 yeah, I landed in the UK. And it, it, by the end of the night, I still don't know anything about him other than his first name, which was George. That's how he introduced himself. Mm. By the end of the evening, he said, I'd like to publish your next book. So now I'm saying, who the heck is this guy? I know it's, a, it's an event for editors, but yeah. you know, he, he, it was German editors. He's English. He's older. He doesn't look like he's an editor still. He had to be in his 90s. Right. And uh, it turns out he's Lord George Wiedenfeld, one of the most famous uh, uh, lords of Great Britain and uh, of, of the United Kingdom. And he, he owned one of the biggest publishing houses in the world. And we, the next day we met for lunch and we, we had a great lunch and we discussed all the different sort of like ideas, what I might write. And being that we're sitting in Sicily, we decided the history of the mafia beginning in Sicily. And, and that's, uh, so, I mean, he made me an author. I couldn't respond. <laughs> yeah. And take, that's, take, and that's take the book, gun. this story book that I'm writing now. Yeah. I said, take the gun, leave the cannolis. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so unfortunately he, he got the contract done for me yeah. and then, and then sadly he passed on. Um, so I wasn't able to see him again, unfortunately, but from long distance, he made sure that the contract got done and they commissioned the project before he passed on. And it was the last, it was the last book deal that he personally, and throughout his life, you know, now and then he would meet writers and would commission a book deal personally, even though he was removed sort of from the, from the company to a, to a certain extent as, as the founder and owner, he wasn't hands on, but I was the last one from what I understand that he personally did. So it's an honor and, I, and uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's incredible. So I'm, I'm about halfway through. I'm, I'm chipping away at it. And, uh, and other than that, I'm trying to get another television series on. Um, the last series was Gangster Code, Inside mm. the Gangster's Code. So it's been a little while, and I just, I'm just i itching to get something new on. And that's it. That's pretty much my life in a nutshell. Other than that, it's pretty boring. Well, yeah, it doesn't sound too boring. So how do you <laughs> – you, there's got to be a sense of – two things. There's got to be a sense of responsibility – I would feel um, because you know to that to that gentleman who gave you that opportunity to write this book and it was his last book. So I, I would feel there's a sense of responsibility there. But I, this is me just projecting. Um, but also, I'd imagine that to write a history book on the Sicilian mob, um, it would there were, would require some delicate. It, you'd go into some delicate territories, no? Especially because of your background. How, how, how does that matter? How do you manage yes that? Yes and no. Yeah, yeah, yes and no. So, so the, the historical part, as far as like um, from the beginning, sort of like the foundations of the mafia, which yeah. I've gone deep into, and I have, I have new perspective that I'm bringing to the, to the, to the sort of like to that whole subject, which, yeah. is, which is really cool. That stuff I don't, I don't need to – I don't need any balancing act, which I'm, I'm used to with my last book. Right. There was a degree of balancing yeah. that had to be done. Um, and I, and I did it, I did it right. I mean, my book, I have a buddy of mine who, who I'm in touch with. He's my dear childhood friend. And he, he, he was, he was with the banana family and he's in, a, he's away now. And I said, you know, how do they, you know, when you tell them you're friendly with me still, how did how do they receive it in there? Cause it's been some time. Yeah. I mean, I, I left there 15 years ago and, uh, he said, they love you. He goes, they're passing your book around right now. <laughs> so, so that's, yeah. So that was, that was a good compliment, you know? So like I did it right. You know, I compliment them yeah. when I can. Uh, I don't, I don't uncover any new crimes. Um, and anything I'm discussing, like for, for, you know, as in my last books, my first book, my memoir, I changed all the identities. Yeah. So the people were around, but I didn't give anybody up and the statute of limitations had expired on all the crimes. So there was nothing to con- be concerned about. Mm. Second book was Mob Rules, the, 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 the bestseller. That book, what I did was, like I said, it was a complimentary to them. It was how you could learn from the different things the mafia does and how to, if you strip away the violence and sort of the evil part of it, and take away the wickedness there there is 
a savvy to their business perspective, to their business approach that can be utilized in the legitimate world. So that's a compliment to them. They didn't have an issue with that. Now the history, everything that I'm writing about up until like present day is history. So then, so there's nobody alive right. that would be offended one way or another. Now, when I do get into present day, sort of like when I bring it up to date, which might be the last 50 or 60 pages of the book, mm. then, we're, then, we're, you know, then, it, then the balancing act again comes into play. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to point out new crimes, even if the statute's up, you don't want to piss anybody off. Right. You don't want to, you know, but, but I could tell it like it is. I, I would never, I would never mislead my reader either. So I'm not going to lie and I'm not going to, you know, be dishonest in any way, shape or form. I just have to figure out the proper way to say things yeah. where, mm. you know, the truth comes across, but no one's offended by it. And that's sort mm. of like the, the balancing act that comes into play. So, and I figure it out because I still see them and I say hello to them and they say hello to me and they're happy to see me. And now I heard that they're passing around the book in jail. So, you know, I mean, it's so, so, so far, so good. So, so <laughs> that, yeah. That's good. So writing a history book though, that's obviously, that would be different to the other, to the other ones, right? I mean, like at least from, I've read Mob Rules and the memoir, so they're they're I suppose um, uh, introspective in a lot of ways, and they're they're your stories and your opinions. But from a, a writing a history book, you've got to gather all the sources, you've got to verify sources. I, this I is much imagine, harder. Right? Yeah, 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 much harder, much harder. So what I'm doing is uh, it's a lot of research, a lot of fact checking. But what I've learned is, in w- with regard to mafia history, and this has become a very frustrating process, and I'll tell you why. Hmm. So let's say you're writing like a, a presidential history or, or, or a war history. Let's say oh, you're over in Australia. Let's say I'm going to write a history of the Anzacs and, uh, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm getting deep into it. Most of, most of the material is recorded uh, so you could fact check. And, right. you know, the, yeah, the, That's a good point. the yeah. stuff is there, you know, other than yeah. like, yeah, other than like personal soldier stories and stuff. But then, you, you know, they're, they're mostly in, in any history, presidential biography. Yeah. You have you have so many things that are recorded, whereas the mafia, because it's a secret society and, not, and, and recording things is punishable by death. There was never really any any sort of like uh, nothing to like fall back on as far as like documentary mm-hmm. that you could say, OK, you know, here I'm going to fact check it over here or there. So I'm reading I'll read multiple sources and I'll get multiple versions of the same incident. And, you know, one guy's relying on a police detective, another guy's relying on a mob snitch, another guy's relying on a prosecutor, another guy's relying on newspaper, you know, where the, jur- the journalists may hype things up to sell papers. And before you know it, you know, they don't even have Italian names right. And th- that's when, when Italians first came to America. You'll find this interesting a- a- as, you know, a-, a descendant of immigrants yourself. When Italians first came to, to America, they-, they the names were strange to, to Americans, to Americans who were already here. So, you know, whether it was German Americans or English Americans or Polish Americans, to hear Italian names was strange. So I'll read about a guy. Let's say his name is uh, Franco DeMarco. I'll read his name twice as Franco DeMarco, and then I'll read it twice as DeMarco Franco. Oh, they right. don't even know what a first or a last name is. So, you know, and then I'll read uh, DeMarquino. De and then I'll read D, D, D Giovanni. And, you know, I'm saying, well, who is this? It's the same guy. And they just didn't know the Italian names. So that, that was an issue with a lot of journalists where they were reporting on names they've never heard before. And, they, you know, there's so many sources have so many different names. But also, too, just like I said, the, the, the one incident might have multiple versions by multiple writers because there was nothing that was really – so now what I do in that instance to, to, to bring you up to date as far as how I'm approaching that is I have that extra sense having lived that life and understood the men in that world and been one of them. I understand what should be true, what should have happened, as opposed to what sort of like sets off a, a bell in my ear saying, there's no way that happened. Or, you know, someone would never have been killed for that. Mm. It, you know, so I could, I could rule out sort of like the, the stories that don't make sense really quickly. Or if there's, or if somebody wants to sort of like um, extrapolate on a theory and say, well, this must be why the guy was killed. I know if that makes sense or not. Hmm. So I'm able to sort of bring my own insights to bear on the project where if there is multiple sources, I have to choose the best one. Hmm. And then what I do is I sort of like just say, okay, based on my insights, what could have happened here? And then I just give, you know, I sort of bring the reader 
along on this sort of inquisitive journey then as I ask it myself, saying, well, that couldn't have happened. That definitely didn't happen. But this is something, you know, if I was around the guy and then maybe I'll bring it up to date with a story. One of my own experiences, I was once around so and so, you know, who who had an issue just like this. And this is how he dealt with it. So this makes sense to me. Mm. This is how something like that would be dealt with on the street, because I, I, I have found that whatever the whoever the mobsters were back in the 1920s or the 1930s here in America, for the most part, they, they sort of were motivated by the same things and sort of abided by the same type of rules and thought the same and acted the same. So there's a lot of common denominators that allows me, I think, to, to bridge that gap between the past and present. And that's it, pretty much in a nutshell. Wow. Well, I'm definitely ready to, uh, to read this book, to sink my teeth in it. Uh, is, was there, is there or was there a, a big connection between the American mob and the Italian? Yes and no. So this is what I found. Nothing, nothing in the world has ever, you know, we use the mafia so loose, the word mafia mm. so loosely today, you know, like, uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the Albanian mafia, the Russian mafia, mm. uh, or we use it for video games. We use it for everything you could think of the rock, uh, you know, rap bands, everybody's a mafia. And there's really only one mafia. There's, you know, the Russian the Albanian, the, the Polish, the, these are all sort of like reflections of, of the real mafia, which was the Sicilian mafia. Mm. And it came from like a long sort of like cultural history, cultural, socio-political history, I should say more accurately. And I went deep into that and the cre- whatever created the mafia in Sicily, and I go into it, it's never been recreated anywhere. So mm. even in America, once the Sicilians landed here, It became something very different, but it still had those cultural roots, almost like almost like the Torah is still the Old Testament. So it's Judeo Christian. So, you know, Christianity is completely different from Judaism. But then again, it's exactly the same. And that's sort of, I guess, the best way to explain the American mafia as opposed to the Sicilian. It's based on the same Sicilian network, the same Sicilian clans, the same Sicilian uh, uh, rules. But. It, it morphed into something very, very unique to America, to its new landscape. And that's something I'm trying to cover as well. But, but again, if you go back, there's really only the Sicilian mafia. Even the American mafia is, is very, very different, and it's not the same. And the, the, the culture that's embedded in the Sicilians, you know, the, the, the ones who started the mafia, it, nothing, nothing is like it anywhere in the world, even in America, it wasn't. So, hmm. which is interesting. And even the words, like they use the word omerta. Omerta means something very different. Like when the Sicilian mafia first used the word omerta, it meant sort of like being a man. It, the root was in, I think, homo, homo, like manliness. Uh, it might have came from the Spanish uh, occupation of Sicily. It might have been a Spanish word originally, but it came from manliness, acting like a man in every way, shape, and form, defending your family, never going to the law, taking care of your business yourself. This was omerta. It was manliness. Then by the time it got to America and went through a generation or two of changes, that word just became keeping your mouth shut. Omerta mm-hmm. is to keep your mouth shut, silence, don't talk about nothing. So it's a completely different word. And that sort of is like one example of the cultural change that took place from Sicily to America. It's fascinating. Yeah, I think it is. It must be an, yeah. uh, you know, it must be an exciting challenge for you, anyway. You know, from a from a, um, a journalistic uh, point of view, and obviously just out of pure interest, because uh, I know you, you've always been a, well, I've always been, but I know you're a, a history buff. After our last chat, I am. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Must be fun. Did you enjoy all the history in that book, in Mob Rules? Yeah, so that was actually, that's what I was going to bring up, was, was Mob Rules. So <laughs> what made you want to write that? So it, 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 it isn't like, um, it's more like a, of a mundane story of how that book came about than, than you might think. It's, it, it was basically, it wasn't something that I, you know, dreamt up or, uh, you know, thought that it would be. I, I was talking to a friend of mine. His name was Harry. Harry Stein, we would go talking back and forth and I would tell him stories now and then mob stories and just, you know, banging heads on the phone one day. He goes, why don't you write a book like this? And he said, you know, something like all the different things you could pull from the mob and put into your, your world today, you know, to business and to the things that you do every day using that life. 
And, and I said, wow, that's a great idea. So I contacted my agent and I put together, you know, a little proposal and I sent it over to her, sort of like a, an amateur proposal. I don't do anything like really, really, like I don't follow the guidebook on proposals. I usually just write something up in my own words, send it over to her. She's sharp. She'll know right away if she can sell it or not. And she liked it. So that was my first, that was like getting past go because she turns down a lot of my ideas if she doesn't think she can sell them. She knows the market. She knows what sells and what doesn't. And when I shot that idea over to her, I said, look, a friend of mine was on the phone the other night. I, he came up with, you know, sort of like a really cool idea. I liked it. I, I wrote this up. I think I could do a lot here. I think I could fill up a book. And she liked it. And she goes, I can sell it. And she did. She sold it right away. So that's sort of how the book came about. It was just a conversation on the phone one day. And, and, uh, and then I couldn't believe how many things I could think of <laughs> that you really could apply and that I normally do every day. Every day I do something that, you know, comes from that world or that life. So, and I get, I get fan mails from around the world on a regular basis from people who run businesses and say, I bought 200 copies for my 200 employees mm -hmm. or, or, you know, or it's changed my life. I sleep with it next to my bed. You know, it's, it's, it's you, you know, this book and Marcus Aurelius or this book and Confucius, you know, I've gotten the most, most flattering emails from people who say that this has become sort of like the, the, the Bible of how to do business, which is really, really nice to hear. You know, and, and it's just basically, you know, the look, mob guys are their businessmen first. Murder is done done so reluctantly, or it should be. Mm. Nowadays, it's done so more easily. It shouldn't be. Murder was always done so very reluctantly because peace means profit. If you're killing people all over the place, you're causing heat, and then you can't make money because the police or the law enforcement, or FBI agents or whoever interferes with your with your with your rackets. So for the most part. Mafia guys, although they do kill because they have to enforce their own laws, just like the government will lock you up and, you know, kill you for treason. The mafia has to kill you, too. But but for the most part, they, they are out every day just doing business to make money. And if you strip away the violence, strip away the murder, strip away, you know, the, 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 the threats and just take take the, the real serious business savvy that most of them have that have become multimillionaires. A lot of these guys, it applies. It applies. If you want to be a politician, it applies. If you want to be a CEO, it applies. If you want to be a metal ma a middle manager, it applies. If you just want to survive in your company. And so, so that's sort of like, you know, I think why it resonated. What did you find were the key characteristics or the key similarities between the most successful mob guys and the most successful business guys? Uh, pragmatism. Mm. I think, I think people have to be pragmatic in, in every which way. Um, you know, like a lot of things get in our way. Uh, and I write about that, you know, you, you have to have focus and you have to sort of like respond, I think, to, to things around you and mob guys are good. They're street guys. So they're constantly responding. They're reactive. They're constantly responding to the events around them. And at the same time, there's, constantly creating new events, trying to figure out how to make new money, what avenue to go down next. And I think that's something that the most successful people in business too know how to do. You know, if you have a company and let's say you produce, uh, I had friends, uh, a friend of mine he sold beepers, you know, pages when pages were around. I don't know what you guys called them in Australia, but it used to beep and then you got a phone number and you called back. We called it a beeper. Some people called it a pager. pager yeah. But he, yeah, he saw a cutting edge. He saw that, it was, you know, it was going into the phone business. So he knew immediately when to abandon the beepers and swap, switch over to phones and not be left behind. So, you know, and this was a guy, he was a half a street guy. So, you know, he knew when to, when to sort of like make that transition. And I think business people are good at doing the same. And also too, it's a lot of human nature. You know, you have to judge the people around you regularly. I think that if you make a mistake with the wrong person under you, it could be devastating. And I think mob people are really good at that. You know, like uh, the people who liked me saw me as somebody, you know, who was trustworthy and could, could you know, could get the job done. And I think, you know, those, those, pe those same people, if they were in business and you're picking, you're picking the people, you know, on your team, mm. you got to pick them right, you know, and you always make mistakes, obviously. That's life. But you try to minimize those mistakes. You do your best to do that. And that's it. You know, there's so many things I, I probably, you know, there's 88 lessons in the book and I probably could have drawn from more. I, I weaned down to the, the best I thought. 
and got 88. But but there's a lot in there. And I think I think that it takes the same to be successful at anything. And I think also too the pitfalls are the same too. Like I wrote towards the end of the book, hubris. It's the biggest killer in the mob. You know, when you think you're all powerful and you're not listening to anybody's advice, it's it's almost time to go. And it's the same thing with the CEO of a company. When you think you're, you know, you're just this genius who knows how to do everything and doesn't have to listen to your team, doesn't need counselors, doesn't need advice from anybody, you're on, you're on the way out too pretty soon. So hubris is a big human killer. You know, whatever, whatever you pursue in this world, you have to always, I think, remain sort of grounded and realize that you know, the people around you could, could like L- Lucky Luciano is a perfect example. Lucky Luciano, everything he did, he, he consulted. He had, he had a couple of Jews, he had a couple of Italians, he had a couple of, he had different guys that he would bounce things off of and they were looking at it from different perspectives and they'd give them their, their best sort of like answers. And then he would take wrap, you know, wrap it all around his head and figure it out, you know, what, what the best approach might be. So he was a perfect example. Capone, believe it or not, Al Capone, he comes across as like, you know, the way the press made him, he looks like this, uh, this buffoon who was running around Chicago, just pushing booze. But if you get into the, the heart of who Al Capone was, he was actually a really smart man. And he had, again, he had Jews around him. He had Italians around him. He had a Welshman. He had a Polak. He had everybody you could think of. He never discriminated against anyone. He had everybody, you know, if you, if you were smart and you were trustworthy, you were worthy of being in his circle. And he listened to these people and he took advice from them. And if they were older than him, he, you know, he was 30 and, you know, the, the, a couple of guys who, who uh, Murray, the camel Humphreys, Jake Guzak, they were older than him, but he took advice from them. If they, if they had sound advice, he didn't say, well, I'm older or I'm smarter or I'm the boss and you're not. He said, what, you know, what, 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 what direction should we take? And then he made the final decision. Those are the best bosses. You know, I mean, his mistake obviously was too much publicity, as was John Gotti's mistake. But they're Nobly Dons. You're, you're, you have a, you're of Italian descent. Mm. You know how Nobly Dons are. Tessadoro, you know, hot-headed. You know, hot-headed. Dons are very show, hot-headed, yeah. but very showy, too. Yeah, yeah. Like, my, mother, my mother's family were all like, you know, they, they liked the, you know, they, Capone and Gotti liked the camera. And, and you know, if, like, my father's family was Bade's. If they were walking in the house, you didn't even hear them. You didn't know. They were very, very low key. They wore like, you know, conservative gray, gray, gray pants. And my mother's family came in with big, bright yellows and, <laughs> and, and purples and, you know, but the, the big orange Cadillac. And they had to hit the home when they pulled up, you know, and I'm not knocking Nobly Don's. They're beautiful people. I'm part Nobly Don. I'm, I'm part Nobly Don, part Sicilian, and part Bades, but I'm just making the point that they're very, very colorful, loud people, mm. and I think that's why Gotti and Capone sort of like the cameras, you know? Right, yeah. It, it, does, yeah. it, it becomes counterintuitive to to the progress you're trying to make, but it's an interesting point, have, keeping that wise counsel, um, and I know it's something that mm-hmm. uh, Na- uh, Napoleon Hill mentions in um, and think and grow rich, and it's it's something uh, that you you definitely see throughout history is those who keep wise counsel for that perspective. I mean, even to an extent, uh, Genghis Khan he didn't discriminate against different religions as long as you bow down to him, I suppose. But besides that, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, being having that acceptance of of uh, any race, any religion, any anything else that can provide you that perspective, uh, as long as it's congruent and in the direction that you you want to to take things. Um, but and then then you see the 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 moments throughout history, like you you've mentioned um, uh, with the hubris, where the pe- people become too complacent and uh, too reliant on the, that things are always going to be the way they are. And usually by that point, it's like you said, the writing's on the wall. We, we see the technology as well all the time, technology businesses within in the startup world. So um, the reason why these startup companies are disrupting a lot of the established uh, businesses is because they've just accepted, they've hit a point where they believe, the bigger companies believe that uh, they're in a safe position, nothing's going to topple them and they become complacent. They don't look at growing anymore. Mm-hmm. They don't look at uh, taking care of their people as much. They lose that thing that got them to where they were. And then when you see um, the startup companies coming through, they have all that. They have that hunger to climb. They have the the desire to to find the right answer and, and keep moving forward. And that's mm-hmm. ultimately where the disruption comes from. It's that desire to keep growing and, and moving forward and innovating versus the desire to just stay the same or or, uh, or not have the the, I agree. the boat the boat shaking. Yeah, I agree. Even like even just the the decision to bring new blood into a company sometimes mm. that's a rough one for people. You know how many how many how many young people, younger, gener- how, many, how, many, how many people from a younger generation do we bring in 
because you know obviously they want to guide the ship differently yeah. but it could be a good thing you know so there's 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 usually like an old person will even have balance with age you know like maybe someone a little younger to bounce something off of yeah. but i think always i think the wisest counsel as a rule of thumb for the most part comes from an older older person i think because experiences is where we learn most of who we, you know who we are is based on you know, obviously all the experiences we have have to be sort of like uh you know it's, how do you say like computerized in the mind you got you got to digest them you got to you know take them in and and ponder them and stuff but but for the most part if you would if you're a smart person to begin with i assume because you can't be you know there are people who are older you say how did this guy get through 60 years or 70 years of life but but there are for the most part experiences are who we are and they sort of like form our thoughts and the more you've been through that's why like an old console yeah way back when an old console yeah was always uh, i'm sorry a console yeah the council of the family was always mm. old because he'd been there and done that he'd seen so many things that if you sat down with him and you had a beef or you had an issue or, or you, he knew how to handle it because he'd been there and done that and then in, in my time they started replacing like 75 80 year old consuliers with 40 year old guys mm. how are you going to compare how are you going to compare the experiences of 40 year old or the knowledge or wisdom of a 40 year old to that of an 80 year old you can't no, can. and it was it was sort of yeah it was the death knell for, for a lot of the families you know, gas pipe told this guy Macaluso, who was 80, step down. You're no longer the consul. Yeah, he replaced him with somebody 40. John Gotti got rid of. You know, when when Joe Piney was 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 done, he he put Sammy the Bull in there. Sammy the Bull was in there, a 40 something year old imbecile. What did he know about being a consul? Yeah, you know, he was a good pit bull if you wanted somebody dead, but not somebody to figure out how to keep peace. Hmm. When his hmm. his answer to everything was kill. That's the council. Yeah, kill, kill, kill. That's like saying I'm going to put a secretary of state, uh, secretary of state in, to who who just wants to go to war, and right. not to talk to any other nations. How far are you going to get in life? Mm. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, there. I think I think that often in business that often happens when you're trying to construct. Unfortunately, you have the the, the blinkers on and you're trying to construct this bias around you. So you want people to right. kind of tell you the answers that you want to hear. And so you end up putting people right. in the position of counsel that you know are going to tell you the things that you already want to hear. Then you end up going into the cycle of, of uh, bias. And that's, like you said before, where all those de crappy decisions end up being made. And then ultimately, that's where the failure leaves. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. So talking about experiences, which, which you brought up and, and define your character, um, one thing that we didn't get into last time, and uh, thanks for, for doing this again, by the way, I've kind of just jumped over that fact that this is this, this is the part two of, of the conversation. And I don't want to start from the start mm -hmm. there because I completely enjoy that conversation. I believe you, you, can't, um, you can't artificially uh, kind of replicate something that just came natural. So I'm, I'm not going to go over anything that we, that we went before. But one thing uh, I did want to ask you about is coming out of jail how did you how did you approach your life then i mean it must have been such a different step to take into the world when you've built your life around um you know the success in the mob and then you obviously ultimately end up in in jail there and then you have this defining moment within there and you start realizing that you're not an animal and you don't want to be treated like an animal and you've decided that the mob isn't what you want to do anymore and, and now you're going to start writing these books but coming out of jail uh can you take me through what was going through your mind then i know it was a while ago but sure yeah sure so i was lost i mean that's probably the best way to put it and for a number of reasons um one is because you become institutionalized and i'll go through that with you mm. and another one is because basically by force of law, I was prohibited from seeing everybody that I considered a friend until that moment in my life. So here I am in my mid thirties and everybody that I've known since, since early childhood, I am being told I can never see again or I'll go right back to jail. So you have to just imagine the, the sort of state of mind in which mm. everything you know until today, everyone you know, you're being pretty much told you can no, never know again at such a late age. You, you know, it's like, you know, it, how, how everything is, who you, how, where do I begin? How, how do I, who do I even call? Who do mm. I talk to? How, where, do, you know, who, who's going to accept me as a new friend also too, with three violent felony convictions. 
you know, you're, someone has to, you know, so everybody who ever did accept me and considered myself and considered me a friend and I considered them a friend, I can't say any new friends I might want to meet aren't going to want to be my friend. If they have any, if they have any brains, they want to <laughs> stay far away from me. Right. I don't want to meet a guy with three violent mm. felony convictions. I don't want to hang out with him. I don't want him in my house. I don't want to go to dinner with him. So that sort of gives you like a really lost feeling. Uh, and then on top of that, to return to the part of being institutionalized, you've been listening to your life has been guided by bells and bars for eight and a half years. You know, the bell rings, you go to chow. The bell rings, you go back to your cell. Mm. The bars open, the bars close. And now suddenly you're thrust into, you know, what's, what apparently looks like a free world. Um, and that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but you're, you're thrust into a higher degree of freedom. And, and with that, are you prepared to handle it? Are, 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 or are you, you know, I wish I, yeah, I mean, I don't know how ready I was. I was still... I had like a friend of mine mentioned it. And I knew what he meant when he said it. I can't remember the artist now, but there was a painting called like the thousand yard stare. Mm. And it was, mm. it was basically painted after someone painted it after world war one to sort of describe like the look of those soldiers returning home from the trenches after world war one. And, you know, sort of like the thousand yard stare, like, you know, where the hell have they been? And, and the friend of mine said, you have the thousand yard stare. I knew right away what he meant. I couldn't remember the, I probably remembered the artist then. I can't now. But anyway, um, I knew right away what he meant. I, I, I knew I must have had it. So it took time to sort of acclimate, you know, to, to, to sort of reacclimate to, to society, to meet different people, to meet new people. You know, I was like, you know, one day I'm washing clothes in a bucket, which is what I used to, how I used to wash my clothes in my cell. And my father goes, why are you washing clothes in a bucket? You know, I have a washing, I had an apartment at the time, but he goes, I have a washing machine and dryer in the house mm -hmm. and there's a laundromat mm -hmm. on the corner. You don't have to wash your clothes in a bucket anymore. You know, or like, you know, it was time to go to bed and I had to get my water and bring my little cup of water next to the bed and put it next to me because it was as if the doors to my bedroom were going to be locked and I couldn't get to the fountain again, <laughs> you know, like, or, or, you know, you know what I mean? Like yeah. little things like yeah. that. Or when my sister said, you know, uh, when I first got home, I slept in my, on my sister's, in my sister's basement before I got my apartment. And she'd come down and she'd go, Lou, and I go, here I am, and I'd shake the blanket. Because if you were under the blanket, they wanted to see you at night with the flashlight. Yeah, yeah. So you shook the blanket to show that it was, you know, wasn't a dead body, I mean, dead body or, or a fake body, and you escaped. So I'm shaking the blanket for my sister. So little things like that, one thing after another, sort of I shed those things. Um, I remember the, the, the first time I did get an apartment and probation came over, parole, or parole officers came over and knocked on the door. And my mind is spinning, you know, my, the law is outside. I got to hide my knife set. Yeah, I bought a knife set for the kitchen. <laughs> and then I had to remind myself, yeah, I'm, what am I doing? I have to, I'm allowed to have a knife set. What am I, what's, what's wrong with me? I'm free. They're not going to see me with a knife and arrest me. So, so it was little things like that. But um, the hardest thing is being lost. Mm. I think I said in my memoir, I felt like I was the ice man who was chipped out of a block of ice. And, you know, now he's just like told to walk around the streets of Manhattan mm. after how many thousands of years. It almost felt like that. You know, things had changed so fast. And don't forget, too, when I went away, there was no Internet. So I came home. People were trying to explain to me the Internet. And I'm going, what the frig is the Internet? <laughs> oh, it's the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web. What does that have to do with a spider? I just don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, oh, the world, the whole web is the it's world is connected now. Yeah. I had no idea what they were talking about. And then, so that, and then I came home too. When we, when I went away, a few of us had cell phones cause we had, we had money, but the whole world didn't have cell phones. I came home, eight year old, nine year old kids are running around with cell phones and going, when did this happen? Well, how do these kids have cell phones? And the cell phones are little small things like Captain Kirk carried, you know, when I, from Star Trek, when I went away, it was a big bulky cell phone, you know, <laughs> so heavy you put it in your pocket, the bricks, your pants fell down. The bricks, right. So, so it was like, yeah, you remember them, right? Yeah. And, and yep. how did you not avoid – this is a question. So I've got – I know a few people um, who have recently come out of jail serving uh, over 10 years, and they've mentioned some of the things that you mentioned. So this this is a question I'm interested in to be able to share with them. Um, so they mentioned the same sort of thing. They, they got out and um, can't associate with people of the past. They – even living, like you said, trying to climatize to things they've they, they don't they're not comfortable in big rooms. They have to sleep against the wall. 
um, even even being in the car, getting motion sickness, mm-hmm. a lot of things that uh, would just become str- yeah. yeah. So just some strange things. But one of the one of my fears for them is them falling back into old habits. So feeling that because of that being that feeling of being lost, that isolation, and in the world being so new, um, and having a fear of how to survive in that. How do they not go back into old habits? How do they not go back into the life of crime? It's a, I'll tell you the easiest way, and it's very, very. It's much more simpler than than they would imagine. Yeah. And it's it's just it's it's a very very it's a question that rests on the force of human will, and this is this is where how I, how I'll elaborate on that. If I swore that even if I have to live in a cardboard box and eat banana peels that I pick up off the floor. I would rather do that than go back to jail. And I swore that. So no matter how bad it got, I said that that is going to be what I will do before I commit a crime and return to jail. Now, now I'm not talking about like someone who goes to jail for dependency, addiction, or what have you. That's something, you know, something very different. That's something that needs, you know, the proper counseling and, they have to work out their own thoughts and, and I wish them well. They need God in their corner at times. That's something much different from just sort of like gravitating toward criminality, not for addiction, not for that reason. Mm. Cause mine was just criminal for the sake of criminal, right? I, this is all I ever knew was criminal conduct. My, I was a career criminal. That's all I knew. So I said to my, you know, and again, I was never addicted to something, so I don't speak for them. There's they're, they're their battle with life is some, somewhat different and harder. But mine, and a lot of people just to go back to the rate of recidivism is high, and, and not all of it is based on dependencies. So a lot of it is just, this is what I know. I'm a criminal, and I, I'm going to go back and commit crimes. Say no, I'm not going to. I'm, I refuse to. And no matter how bad things get, I don't care. And now, so at one point, I was tested where John Gotti is the Gotti that everybody knows around the world. Documentaries have been made about him. He was a, a, a notorious crime figure of the 20th century. But Gotti had a lot of family members. So one of his nephews, who was a dear friend of mine, saw me when I came home from prison. And I won't say his name, which one, but he offered me a, a no-show construction job where I would just basically you know, make 100000 or, or, or $120,000, $130,000 a year basically just, uh, you know, signing my name. I didn't have to work. And it was at a time when I desperately needed money. I, just, I don't know how to survive. You know, I'm trying my hardest to figure it out as I go. And I made the decision that I would rather lose my apartment, fall behind in the rent, pack up, leave and go live on the street than do that because it's going back to that world. And, and I don't want to go back to that world. So I kind of politely thanked him, gave him a big hug and a kiss because he's a gem. And it was nice of him to ask me. It was so actually, in a, in, a, in a way, in that world, it was very caring of him mm-hmm. and sensitive to ask me. Believe it or not, you know, you, 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 your listeners may say, how the hell could a mobster be caring and sensitive? But in his way, he was saying, look, you just did all that time in jail. I want to help you out and get you back on your feet. In our world, that's being caring, mm-hmm. just like somebody else might say to you, you know, you could sleep in my house till you get somewhere to live, you know, which is the same way of being caring. So he was looking out for me, but it was just in a way in which I didn't want. I didn't want to return to that world. So again, I made it in my head. I also left money on the street. I had loan shark money out there that I never collected. And I just said, you know, if I go out there collecting the money, you know, you can't walk around with a baseball bat threatening people for your money and say, I'm not in the mob. Mm. So I'm not going to, I'm going to have to sign it away. And when you desperately need it, it's hard to just say the hell with it. You desperately want to call somebody and say, Hey, you have that money for me. You know, I waited this long. I want it now, but you have to resist. So, you know, translate that into whoever they are and whatever their situation is. And the bottom line is just say, no, I'm not going to commit crime. I don't care how bad things get. I will try to find a job. If I can't find a job, I'll, I'll, I'll hustle I'll, I'll carry groceries mm. at the supermarket for people I'll, or I'll, 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 you know, I'll sit and beg, but I won't steal. Right. You know, that's the bottom line. You know, how far are you willing to go? A lot of people just go out ah, the hell with it. I'm, I, I tried and I, and I, it didn't work. I gave it my best. And now I'm going to go back to what I always did. Or this is all I know, which is the biggest cop out. 
because you ha- you have the human brain. Our brain is the same brain as the same, you know, as might be a little different than Einstein's, but there's a lot of evidence to show that it's the same brain Einstein had on his shoulders. If we can't figure out how to do something different, then, you know, I mean, come on, it's a cop out. We can. So, I mean, just say no, just say no to crime. Just like people say, say no to drugs, say no to crime. Right. In absolution. So it's, yeah, it, absolutely. You know, and yeah. it's all or nothing in it. It's, and it's always, yeah. it's funny that you mentioned something then as well is, um, it's funny how in our most vulnerable and weakest states that the temptations appear the most, um, and always, it, and it's always, always there. It's always there. You know, it's, it, it comes out in that point. And I can imagine what, what you keep going. Sorry. What, what you just said is sort of like, what you just said is cause I'm a firm believer in that. And what you just said is sort of like, to me is, is confirmation that there is a higher power mm. or some type of like, you know, mysterious force that governs the world, because how could it always happen at that time? Mm. You know, think about that. And you know it and I know it. Just as soon as you said it, it clicked in my head. I said, always. I always say that to myself. Always at the most vulnerable times does it happen. And, and you know, like, you, you, could, you, could live, you could live life your whole life. And if you never, you know, and never have that mm. moment of temptation until you desperately want to grab at it and reach for it. And that's when it comes. And that's when it comes. And if, if you don't tell me that's, yeah, and if you don't tell me that's proof of a higher power testing on mm-hmm. it. You know, I mean, you know, I'm no holy roller. I'm not going to, you know, amen, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm not that guy. But, uh, but, uh, but I'm a guy who sees when, the, when there's some type of mysterious yeah. force at work. And that's pure evidence to me. No, I agree. I think it was in the Bible. Yeah. I think in the, yeah. in the New Testament, right? When, I think when Jesus was, was out in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, and then the devil appeared mm-hmm. and, and offered him that salvation. And going back to absolution again, he just was like, no, no, no. So whether you're religious or not, you take away the, the same the same lesson from that story. It's, it's when you're at that point, if you, that's when your absolution or that's when that, that commitment to you or a promise you've made to yourself at some point is going to be tested. And if mm-hmm. you're not absolute about it, you'll falter, you'll break and you'll repeat. So you have to be able to find that salvation. And here's, here's, that leads me to my next question to you then. You came out, you felt lost, you felt isolated, you couldn't associate with friends. Um, where did you find your salvation to all that isolation? Hmm. I guess it was just through time working through it, I guess, you know, little by little, very, very little. It's a slow process. Um, I learned patience in jail. I never had any patience, never. And uh, it's, a, it's a very bad thing not to, not to have patience. It's, a, it's, it's the most horrible downfall in, in, our, in our makeup to not have patience. And I learned it. So little by little, just chipping away, little by little, you know, like uh, eventually someone gives you a chance mm. uh, at something, uh, and then that might lead to a second chance, or eventually someone takes a liking to you and realizes maybe you're not so bad, you know, maybe all the things they heard about you, or all the things on the surface, you know, may may be true, but doesn't make you, you, you know, Idi Amin. Mm. So maybe they take a second look at you and give you an opportunity maybe that you'd never had before. And then little by little, things like that, um, you know, happen and sort of like, you know, it's like almost like trying to tear down a wall, but, but not even brick by brick, but chip by chip. And, and that's, that's where I think having learned patience in prison, I realized that I'm going to need it again. And, and I'm still, look, I still have to have patience, you know, and, you know, I still, we all, every single one of us has, you know, you know, good times and bad, and, and, you know, look right now, even though I'm writing a book, right? So it takes a couple of years. I thought it would take a year. Then I thought it would take two. I might be going on my third year and it, it'll be done by the third, but you know, it's a lot more work than I realized in that, in that interim, I have to constantly figure out uh, uh, how to, how to, how to maintain an income hmm. so that I can survive until the book is handed in, you know, because I'm not Stephen King where they just cut you a check for millions of dollars. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you know, you're on a shoestring budget and you, and, and you have to figure out how to make it happen. So, and I do, you know, and, and I, you know, try to pursue other things at the same time and then, and try to juggle, you know, the research. And so it's always a struggle. Life is always a struggle. And then we're faced with all the, all the problems that we always have besides business, right? Mm-hmm. You have a million other problems. And, and so, you know, it's always something, but I think learning patience is like a really, really like, I can't, I can't stress that enough to everybody in this world that, and, and the people who are born patient end up going the farthest. It's like the turtle in the hair. 
you know, they get the farthest in life. They had a guy once told me, I don't remember where he, he had read it, but he told me there was sort of like this little test they do with kids or some sociologists had done a test where they tell the kid, um, look, there's a piece of chocolate, but on the table or whatever it was, and you can't eat it. I'm going to be back in 10 minutes. And the kid was hungry. The boat, you know, the kids that are taking the test are hungry. You can't eat it until I get back. And then, you know, the kid, the kid that eats it within five minutes and the kid that eats it within two or the kid that doesn't eat it at all, they grow up to, to have the exact same paths reflective of their patients. You follow? Yeah, yeah, so in other yeah. words, the kid, that eats, yeah, the kid that grabs it to chocolate and eats it right away, he's the kid who ends up like me in jail. You know, the kid that waits five minutes, he sort of has, a, you know, a, a, a medium sort of degree of patience and gets maybe, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, to a decent place in life, but not doesn't go all the way. And the one with the patience is the one who, 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 who gets the farthest, you know, with whatever they put their mind to. Right. Obviously, you know, we all have different goals and who knows what that kid's going to grow up to want to do. But whatever they choose to do, they get the farthest in doing it. I don't remember where he had read it, but it was I heard the, um, it was the, the mushroom test, uh, the uh, marshmallow test. That's what is it called? I'm sorry. The marshmallow test. I think this is, oh, you're familiar. With yeah. Yeah. Show. I think, okay. I think there's a, there might be a, did, I, did I reinterpret it right? Yeah, yeah no, that's exactly right. No, 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 no. That, was, that was, that was exactly right. I think there's even a, a documentary okay. on it now, but it's, it's all around that idea okay. of delayed gratification. The, the concept of if I right. give into something now, even when I've been told not to versus understanding, um, like you said, patience to wait for something for the, for the payoff towards the end. And, and there was that huge correlation right. between those who weren't able to um, delay that, that gratification uh, versus the ones who, who couldn't. And, uh, and, and they followed them through their, through their career and their life. So it's an interesting. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I'll look for it now, now that, now that we just, I haven't thought of it since it was told to me. But uh, I'll look for it now. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to either read it or see it on a documentary because it is interesting. But yeah, uh, yeah. Well, you can imagine. I mean, you're. Yeah, I was. I was looking at, at your. I was reading your your book again the other day. Actually, I shared it to a, a friend of mine. I haven't got it with me. I gave it to him to to borrow. But um, mm-hmm. the memoir. Sorry, I've got the mob rules in front of me. And those stories mm-hmm. of you're a, you're a hijacker, right? I mean, a a guy in that world yeah. is basically someone who says, "Well, I want that thing, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take that thing." So. Uh, I want it now. I want it, yeah. I, I want it now. But um, yeah, so I, I can imagine how, how that would have been a lesson for you, especially being in, in jail where it's, you're, it's, you can't have those things now. So you would have been forced to have to have learned that, that degree of patience and it's obviously um, paid off. Um, what are, here's, here's something else that I wanted to, to kind of dig into a little bit is now that you're out and life's quite different to what it would have been 15 plus years ago, what have you kept from that life? What have you kept from your days in the mob and, and even in jail that has served you, that is serving you well still to this day? Uh, so I, I would think, you know, it's basically honor. You know, when you, when you go to jail, I had this sense of honor that even if, even if it, it really looking back, maybe it, it wouldn't be considered by most people as honor. But to me, to go to jail and, you know, I had the choice where I could have even, I mean, look, I could have went into the witness protection program. I could have even snitched and been a confidential informant, but I had to look at myself in the mirror. So I maintained my honor. I thought it was an honorable thing to do to accept your own, your own punishment for what you've done. And that was something, a decision I made. Look, I, a lot of the guys who snitch say, well, I didn't do this and why should I pay for that? And, but they forget that all the bad things that they really have done and, and the, the fact that they are deserving of some form of punishment, they completely forget that. They don't mm. want to be punished. Mm. So I think that, you know, this sort of sense of honor that I had, I, you know, I, I, I feel like even if it wasn't, if you could say, well, gee, that's not honorable being a criminal and going to jail, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. But whatever, whatever I felt like motiv- motivated me to sort of try to maintain that honor, now being a, a, a citizen who lives the proper way, I would still try to maintain it in every way. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that's basically, I guess, you know, something that's very important to me, you know, and, and how do you maintain it? There's a million different things that we could do to be dishonorable. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you could, you could, uh, you don't want to take the fall and you point to your colleague at work. Or do you want to say, yeah, it was me. It wasn't him. 
or it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, this one under me or that one above me, or that's responsible. It was me. I did that or, you know, or whatever it might be, you know, there's always, a, there's always something that that'll re- relate to, you know, that that'll sort of like bring you back to making that decision. And, and that's it. Living up to your word, you know, doing what you doing, what you say you're mm-hmm. going to do, live up to your word. You know, don't talk about it. Be about it. It's something we used to say in the street and in jail. Don't talk about it. Be about it. We, and people would say that normally, like if somebody was going to fight, I'll do this. I'll break your neck. Mm-hmm. Don't talk about it. Be about it. But it was a bad way to say it now. But I mean, then rather. But if you take that now, that little saying and you apply it now, it makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Don't talk about hmm. it. Be about it. How much how many of us just talk? I want to do this. I want to do that. That's, you know, do it. Go out and do it. You know, if even even if I was a bad guy, I wanted to rob an armored car. I robbed it. So now now apply that to today. If I want to do a new, if I want to have a write a new book, or if I want to you know a TV series, or if I want to you know I wrote a brain book and I have a theory about the human brain. I wrote a book about it. How many times I talk to somebody about my brain book and then and you know my theory my my theory about the brain? Then I just said, why don't I just do it? Why don't I write it? Write it out. Do it. You know, and don't don't be discouraged that people are scientists and neurosurgeons and uh, neuroscientists and they might laugh at me and say, you're an idiot. You don't know anything about the brain. I have an idea. I believe it's worthy of, of, of repeating. So put it out there. So I sat and I, you know, I sat and I, it took me a year and I wrote it. So I think that's something big that, that I took from that world and, and applied here. Hmm. The other thing is confidence too. I want to say something. I, I thought I was, I thought I was confident back then to rob, to feel like I could rob a bank and on the car, hijack a truck, whatever I was doing, I had the confidence that I would pull it off, but it wasn't confidence. It was more so cockiness. Confidence is sort of like a mature cockiness. Mm. And I didn't have confidence then, but now I feel like through all the education and knowing, knowing, you know, like as much as I, you know, I, I can about the world and learning, I think we, we, we sort of, when, when, when you could probably relate to this, I'd imagine through your own life experiences. Like, you know, you get to a certain place where you are pretty confident in yourself. Look, when you, when you reached out to me, you said, look, this is who I am. This is what I do. And I, and I'm going to be honest with you a lot, a lot of times, you know, I don't want to be bothered with a radio mm-hmm. show, you know, it's, it's time consuming and I get tired of listening to myself talk, but whatever you wrote in the email, I got back to you and said, sure, let's do it. So you, you had to have some element of confidence that, that translated in your email for me to respond to you right away and say, sure, let's do it. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, no, I don't know if that, no, if, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I get it. It's, we were talking about this. I'm, I'm just laughing to myself or in, in, under my breath just because I was talking to, I had a, uh, I host these dinners every three months or so with, mm. I, I call it a round table dinner, but it's like, you call it a mastermind dinner, whatever you want. But there's these entrepreneurs and business leaders and just interesting people that are put together in a room. And one of the things we talked about is pretty much what what you were just mentioning then about your uh, um, there has to be a level of of uh, I suppose optimism and even a level of naivety for for you to always pursue things that other people would be able to convince themselves isn't possible, right? I mean, anyone who's become successful in anything, whether it is you hijacking uh, a truck, whether you whether it is you writing a book, especially a book like The Three Pound Crystal Ball, which seems to be quite out of your wheelhouse when you look at the the, um, the genres of stuff that you write. On the surface, most people, if you're logical, would, uh, would look at those sort of things and say, well, it's not possible. You can't be done. There's too many moving parts, you know, mm-hmm. whether yeah, all those different things. Mm-hmm. So there has to be a level of naivety in in a positive Mm -hmm. way and Mm -hmm. a level of optimism Mm -hmm. for anyone to be successful in in anything uh and something else that you mentioned there was about confidence and one of the Mm -hmm. things which completely relates to this is and this is something i believe confidence is built when you keep promises to yourself so when you say i'm going to do something and you Mm -hmm. do it you become more confident you build you you build that self-efficacy that belief that i can do that thing excellent right yeah Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. It's so true. And you're right. And what was getting back to the naivety? It's so true. What was that? What was the quote? You might know it. There was a great quote. Uh, gosh, said something like um, something about the, 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 the world. And, and if, I'm going to I'm going to <laughs> shoot it out as best as I yeah. can remember. And you may hone in on it. Something about like um, 
the the people who come up with the the, the craziest ideas and uh, considered stupid, uh, but are, but are willing to 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 say it anyway and do it anyway, as opposed to the people who take the straight course and and it said something like, but all all progress, all of the world's progress, is is on account of of the former. Do you do you remember that? It's an English it's an English writer. You remember, right? I, I do. I do know. I won't, I'm definitely not going to be able to. I'll butcher it even. I'll, yeah, I'll butcher that. You know it. You know the quote, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How long do I have you for as well, by the way? I don't want to keep you for too long. And, and uh, oh, oh, now. Now. We're, we're, it's after five. I'm glad you asked. I apologize. <laughs> no, no. That's... Yeah, Shabbos comes in in a few minutes. That's fine. Okay, so I want to make sure I get this. I want to get this, this question out there because this is a question I, also, I ask all my guests. What is your perspective of failure and mistakes? I, th- I think the I think the great the greatest the greatest achievements come from failures and mistakes. So yeah, I mean it's just it's just dealing with them in the moment. But I think that you should learn to appreciate them and 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 reflect on them. And then and that's every every great biography I've ever read is is sort of like you know three hundred pages of failures and mistakes before you you know, before that person begins to shine. So, you know, the great, the greatest people who have made the most, you know, sort of like, you know, the most, the deepest imprints on this world are loaded with, you know, a life, a life history of failures and mistakes, whether men or women, men or women, both. So, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of it in a nutshell, you know, it's just basically that's what, that's what you're made of. What do you see as your biggest failure or mistake and what did you learn from it? I, I think, my entire first half of my life was nothing but failures and mistakes. And I think, you know, this is sort of like part two and I still make them, but not as crucial. I think, you know, I, I think, you know, I've sort of like learned to, to when you, when you, when you make, when you take the chances and the risks now, make sure that they're not life threatening where they're going to derail you for 10, 15, 20 years. I think, I think, you know, be very careful going into things, you know, that, don't be afraid to make a mistake. Don't be afraid to fail. Just make sure that you could, you could pick yourself up pretty quickly because life is short. My first string of failures and mistakes wiped out, you know, between courts and prison, uh, you know, a good and, and probation and parole, a good 15 years of my life. Mm. So, you know, there's no, there, there isn't really a lot of time for failures and mistakes like that. But even if you do make one, but even if you do make one and find yourself, entrapped in something that takes that long then so be it it, it, it maybe all the more it will mold you like like mine did so i think that's it in a nutshell fail fast all right brother yeah listen if, we, if you ever if you ever want to catch up again for a few minutes bro you know you, you, yeah you're my man bro I, I you know we get along anytime um, i'm sorry no, I no, no. You, right do, now. you do what you gotta do okay all right have a great have a great have a great weekend bob you and your family brother okay you too bye-bye ciao Okay, take care. Bye. Ciao.